This is the combination meeting with the Sheep and Lamb Division and the Feeder Cattle Department at the 1981 National Farmers Convention in Indianapolis, Indiana. And now here's Dick Hammond, Director of the Sheep and Lamb Division. Share this with you because I'm coming just exactly from the same direction as Devon Woodland comes from in his comments last night. There's a lot of people out there that want and need NFO, particularly need it. They don't really know, lots of them don't know what we're really all about. You know, we've come a long ways. We were at one time a, a political protest group, and now we've, we've evolved into an agribusiness situation, a collective bargaining unit uh, utilizing our commodities for our strength factor. Uh, this gentleman, this comes out of the magazine here that is a sheep man's magazine. And his statement is, he's the president of uh, a large organization, a sheep organization. It's difficult to be positive in these situations when your very livelihood is being drained away in a tug of war between prices we receive and the costs of production. It doesn't take much these days to hit the bottom of the barrel. Somehow the industry will survive. And although it's been said many times before, in fact for decades, the need for positive action is absolutely essential within the next 10 months. That can only mean change of a very positive order. That means setting goals, not just offering good intentions. Then see the whole industry is aligned and get ready to meet those goals. No maybes, no second guesses, no faint hearts, no baloney. It would seem that the industry should call a summit meeting within the next month to get these goals moving. Now this is from an organization that has been contacted by NFO and has had, has felt not possibly in so many words, but has felt that they did not want to get involved with NFO, that they could run their own business, and they have gone their own way. Our situation, our, our needs are mutual. They have a problem, and we have the system that can solve their problem and ours along with it. I'm going to send along a uh, report to the Washington office of this particular unit of, of sheep men. The man that's going to read that will, won't, won't know me, and I, well, he, he does know our NFO's uh, philosophy, so he'll, he'll have that background, but he won't know me, and he'll read that. And I'm pretty confident this moment in time that when he reads that, he's going to say, gee, this is just exactly what we, we need. Why aren't we using it? He's saying it right on. That's how confident I am of what he's going to think. And then off in the corner, somebody's going to say, that's an NFO presentation. And all of a sudden, we'll go back then to the image and, well, we don't want to get tied up with an outfit like that or whatever their thoughts are. It's very important that we get our image changed and the message across. Now, the good thing about this is that the people that have been at these meetings and this convention are sure no sunshines soldiers. Devon mentioned it last night. It's not much fun being a general and when the first bullet whistles by, he turns around, he's got a, a clear field. We've got the hardcore people in. We've got the people that not only understand, but have made the long-term commitment. There's, there's not too many short-timers in our group anymore. They're either, they either bought it or they left it alone. So we're very fortunate at this moment in time because we have the veterans now in place and we need to get the message out into the country. I'm not trying to sell you anything at this, this talk here. I, what I'm trying to do is make you aware of what you can do for yourself, for your neighbor, because you're entwined with him. This financial mess that we're in is a communicable disease. It, you know, it doesn't stop at your, at your uh, 
a boundary line or, the, or your neighbor's boundary line. It's all the way across the nation. Uh, I had occasion, and I think this serves to show you how far we've come. We can all remember the 1973 Great Grain Wreck. Boy, what a mess, and we're still paying the bill for that. Everyone I see nodding, true. But I also remember that we've learned something from that. I can stand before you without any reservations and tell you that anything that NFO has promised me as far as an organization and to back me up, they've done. Now, they may have disappointed a lot of people, but they sure haven't disappointed me. And the occasion I'm going to speak about is 1976. We have a regular NFO meeting in Montrose, Colorado, structured by the county leaders, made up of a group of sheepmen who want to price their livestock. We get our inventory together. We get our, our uh, numbers, inventory, the kind, when we're going to ship, when we're going to deliver, the whole ball of wax, put the price on it, and in true NFO fashion, and this works in our sheep department all the time, is I do not tell the people what to do. Our membership tells us what to do. Now, in this situation, the NFO priced their lambs. I contacted the farm, uh, the farm bureau had contracted, contacted us from, from Kansas, and in turn, we made a firm, solid contract with the farm bureau people in Kansas in June. And the minute it happened, just like it always does, the minute we contracted, the market went up. Then everybody looked at that nice, fat market and became uncontractable. Sound like feeder cattle? Mm -hmm. And down came the market, and until the time we came, delivery went continually down. On August 30th, when we began delivery, we had a $38 market. And my, I, you know, I kept thinking, boy, I hope, I hope they'll take delivery. They started delivery, and we got 4,000 lambs on the trucks and down the road. And I said, wow, am I, I'm happy. You know, the rest of the growers are happy. We're all happy. God, we've got these things sold, and they're going down the road. Then the checks begin to bounce, and the drafts begin to be no good. And I don't know, 20,000 lambs is one hell of a lot of lamb to eat. And I'll tell you, you couldn't, I, I couldn't describe the feelings I had at the moment in time. I mean, it just, it's indescribable. But I can also tell you, I call that home office. In a matter of a few hours, they had a special plane. They had lawyers and accountants. And when they dropped down in that landing field, in that Kansas wheat field, I was a happy soul to see those people because they said, we've come to help you. We went in, talked to the banker, and the banker, just in so many words, says, look, that's your problem. I'm not giving, advancing the money. There's not enough equity in the people that have bought these lambs, even though I've extended credit to them, told you we had a good contract, and I hold lien and first title lien and mortgage on these lambs. They're yours. So I worked out of the Farm Bureau office in Cimarron, Kansas, for three days, and everybody in the industry knew that we were right straight over the barrel. It couldn't have been a more wonderful opportunity for those that had no well wishes for NFO. But even despite the weak and lousy bargaining position I was in, we took the market from 38 to 43. And I finally sold the lambs at $43. Seven and a half dollars roughly per head less than what we contracted for. Now, we've got 4,000 lambs that we've delivered. It took us 10 days to get that money straightened up and get the legality straightened up. We paid the full market price to the NFO members for that breach of contract, plus all of the rest of the 16,000 lambs that were delivered on that contract in 1976 dollars, gentlemen, 1976 dollars. Now, five years later, this June, 
we got an opportunity to get to court. We won our case hands down. It was almost embarrassing because when we described the miserable situation that we had, the jury was just right there. We had to watch we didn't have a mistrial because they could just see the injustice of it all. We were awarded the $157,000. Now we go to appeals. I don't know what this thing, when it will be settled, but if inflation stays the way it is, I don't know if there's any, going to be anything left of the $157,000 of 1976 money by the time we get it. But I know one thing. Our members and the people that I represent as a, as a sheep director were paid and paid in full. Now that is an important win. That is an important factor to say, okay, we had a great grain wreck, but we also had, the, here's one of those stories that don't get out. It don't get out. It's not something, it's a headliner. I'm going to remember seeing that situation of uh, James Jones in, in, in Guyana. And on the gate leading in there, was a sign that said, if you do not learn from history, you are doomed to repeat it. Now, folks, we've got one, we've got quite a history. We've got quite a track record, and more, you know more about it than I do. But I also can say we're learning from it and have learned from it. And this is one of the, of the reasons why, when we had this problem in the sheep division, it was settled the way it was. We do not operate on the co-op basis in the sheep department. Basically, where my best programs operate are where the director and the home office has the least amount to say about what's going on. It's not uncommon. In fact, it is a standard operating procedure to have NFO members have a meeting in the country, get their inventory together, call me on the phone, give me a price, and tell me what they want done and for me to get busy and do something. And if I can't exactly do, if I can do better than what they tell me, of course, I have free rights to do. If I do not, I come back and we talk it over. It's always in their hands as far as the final judgment is concerned. You do not have any real dictatorial policies from the sheep division until we get to where we're signing final contracts, contracts for sale, and when I involve the trust. And once I involve the trust, if I expect to get the backing and the insurance coverage for you people, then I've got to do the book work that's required by that trust. Now that, we can have, we can have some, some little problems with once in a while as far as book work's concerned because people just can't understand why we got to have this signed and that signed and this dated and all that, but it's important. I can tell you it's important because I know that every time I've had a problem and I've had my book work done correctly, I've got no problem with NFO getting the job done and getting it over with. To show you the difference of when you have people that do not understand NFO, this year in Montana, they called me and said, we have a couple loads of lambs up here, Dick, they're non-members. Can you help us? And I said, well, what's the story? And he said, well, they been go to this local buyer and he's bidding them 40 cents and, and they don't want to take the price. And I said, what do they want? Well, all they can get. And I said, well, you know, what? I got a price. Well, what's the market, Dick? I said, well, the market's around 45 cents. And they said, fine, see what you can do. I got, I see that's where I made my mistake. Now, if I'd have got a quarter more, I'd have probably got this deal through. But I got five bucks and they just couldn't handle that. <laughs> So when we got the five bucks from those people for them, this guy that had been sitting in the corner store with his feet up on a cracker barrel all of a sudden and feeling where the hell are they going to go with their livestock, finds out that they have got a place to go. And his next move is hot foot it down the road and get a hold of those good old boys and tell them what a mistake he made and that he'll give that much money and all they just don't need to have to go out of town to get their sheep sold. And that's just what they did. Non-members, people that didn't understand. The problem was then I've got lambs to replace the buyer that I sold them to. 
Fortunately, I had them sold high enough that I could go anywhere I wanted to and buy lambs without any loss to NFO. In fact, I could buy them and make money if I wanted to on a margin. So that posed no problem. We got a lot of people saying they're dirty, rotten, son of a guns. That's not the case. They just don't understand collective bargaining. They don't understand that they would have got 40 cents if there hadn't been somebody around keeping that guy from cutting their throats. And they don't even understand it today. But that's the message we're going to have to get across. Because if you think this industry is not sick, you just listen to those bankers. I, it's always a big kick for me to watch these guys in the western part of the United States drive up in their super four-wheel pickup trucks with their zinging aerial, you know, and climb out of that with that great big hat and the feathers all over them and the, and the big boots and the whole ball of wax. And I look at them and I said, you know, isn't that wonderful? You don't own that hat and boots. The banker does. He's just letting you wear them tonight for a certain amount of money at the interest. Because that's just the way it is. That's reality. And we're looking at people that are going to have to face the facts. And I know a lot of you people have gone down the road and you've knocked on doors, you've made all the missionary calls, you've done all of the good things, and you're to a point that you say, damn, those people, if they don't want to follow NFO, I can't do anything for them. But I'm telling you one thing, that's, unfortunately, that's just like having a fire in the field right next to you and say, well, it's going to stop at the fence line. It's not going to stop at the fence line, and you're going to have to get involved with it whether you like it or not. And we're in it. And if we don't change it, I don't see where we're going to be able to get the financial backing. I believe that right in the very near future that people walk in and say, I have professional representatives handling and marketing my commodities are going to have a whole lot more house with a banker than some guy says, well, I'm here again. I had a bad year last year and I had a bad year next, the year before that and I don't look too good this year, but I think maybe the year after that's going to be okay. I don't think it's going to buy much. I really don't think it's going to buy much. I just heard this. For Dick, you know, the guy just said, well, I guess the industry will just survive. Well, I'll tell you one thing. You can, when you start listening, I sat there last night and somebody says, well, we had six million in, in 50 and about two and a half million farmers today. That tells me somebody's not surviving. I don't know. Maybe it's not important to some people, but I think the people that are here, it's darn important to them. I want to say one thing to you. Walking, there's no trick to walking on water when you know where the rocks are. Now, I know where the rocks are in marketing and bargaining of sheep. You guys know where the rocks are when it comes to having to go out here and organize and contact people. Now, you've been over this course. You know the pitfalls of it. You can tell me. I, you can run down the course of action at what's going to happen at a meeting that you're going to call. You can tell it to me almost raw right now. And I can tell you the same problem bargaining. But it's not going to go away. And I'm going to tell you something right now. You people at one time were paranoid. You don't need about any worry about anybody crowding you anymore. Nobody wants in this cactus patch with us. It is just too darn thorny a situation for anybody to compete. Now, when the time that you've got to watch your backside is when you get your cactus patch cleaned out enough so that you can get a trail through there, and then they can open up a highway, then you'll have the, just like we did in the West, when it got rid of the Indians, then all of a sudden we had a lot of, a lot of settlers. But up till then, it was kind of sparsely populated. And that's the same thing you're finding here in NFO. It is a thorny situation, and that's why you have not had the farm organizations jumping into the situation as NFO with both feet. But it is important work. It's frustrating work. I've asked different farm organizations, particularly this one I'm talking about, why don't you do more marketing? And his exact words were, it's too frustrating. It's too unproductive for a meeting. And yet it is one of the vital key aspects of a meeting. You open up their book, you'll find all the kinds of veterinarians that are going to address their conventions. But boy, they're not sick in the sheep. They're sick in the price. And they need the economics professors and they need the bargainers and the marketers to be talking to them. Now to show you what I'm talking about, just plain ordinary collective bargaining, whether it's sheep or whether it is feeder calves or fat cattle, this whole formula applies.
right here, we got Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Right here, we got Redfield, South Dakota. Right here, Rochester, New York. Right here, we have Detroit. And right here, we have Ohio. Now, just looking at those dots, they really don't mean a whole hell of a lot. Just a bunch of places on the map. You've heard them all, all of them before. Now, let's see how they interact. Now, let's take five little towns around that Redfield, little towns. And we got 60 lambs here, and 35 here, and 75 here, and a 225 here, and another 50 over here. Now they're just five small bunches of sheep. And the only place those sheep can go is the, the predominant market, which is Sioux Falls. Now the buyer in Sioux Falls has got one idea in mind. To buy those lambs as cheap as possible. I've got one idea, and that's to sell them as high as possible. Now keep this in mind because you've still got a lot of people in the country, you talk about misconceptions, you've still got a lot of people in the country that address me or think of me as a buyer. I do not work for anybody else but NFO. My job is to sell higher, not to buy lower. And keep it, where there's 180 degrees difference. A, a NFO rep is selling your lambs and he's selling them as high as he can get. A buyer is representing his buying interest and he's buying them as cheap as they are. Now that's got to be a definite line. We have definitely have people out there that have no idea. I wonder if you went into an FA or a young farmers meeting, I wonder how many people would know the difference. And how many people have made an effort to let them know. Okay, that's the difference. Is I'm trying to get high and he's trying to get lower and we're on a collision course. Now the way I'm structured right there, I have no other place to go but right here. He knows it, I know it, and he knows I know it. So there isn't any game, so they're gonna go his way. But all of a sudden, with those guys making a telephone call here, 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 and here, I now have 450 lambs, or 45,000 pounds of weight, and I have something that's a phenomenal situation, I have wheels. Now, I haven't made the lambs any fatter, I haven't made them great anymore, I haven't made them weigh anymore, or anything different about the quality of the lambs, but I have added one hell of a factor to it, the wheels. Now, this gentleman who's sitting here waiting for these guys to come in when they, when he knows when they got to come, is surprised because we now go directly over here and go to Rochester, New York. Now, I'm not asking for the sacrificial lamb situation either. I'm not asking you to make this trip and then put two dollars to boot. I'm talking about measuring what we could get here against our realization here, and it's got to be as good or better or we don't move. We got to do something different. But we just tied it. What happens? Immediately this market goes up. He's lost supply. He's now got to get out. By the same token, these people that were sitting in here, your neighbors, who watched you load up your sheep and go to New York, are now able to go into Sioux Falls, South Dakota and sit back and say, I don't know what's the matter with those some of these NFO people. They gotta go all the way to New York to get 50 cents net to them, and I went to Sioux Falls and got 50 cents net. I can't understand what's wrong with them. The only difference is they don't know what caused the 50 cent price. By the same token, we got this little dot down here now. That's Ohio. I've told the board of directors about it, so I'm not talking behind their back. The Ohio people are selling anywhere from three to five dollars less than the people here. Now, don't take too long for him to put two and two together, and down he comes and he fills up. He makes this one or two dollars better for these people. They're feeling great, and we go down the tube, and now what do we do? I've got to look to the soft spot. I've got to go here, I'm working on a contract in Detroit, five-year contract, cost of production contract. I don't know whether we're gonna get anywhere with it or not, but you can bet on one thing, I got an open mind, and I am gonna go there, and I'm gonna to listen to what they got to say, and I'm gonna see if that's gonna make money for these people. If it will make money for those people and do them a better job, I'm gonna present it to them. Now, I'm not coming in and saying, now you people are gonna do this, but I'm gonna go up there and give them something they don't even know about, and let them make their judgment, and I'm sure that if I'm gonna make them money, uh, 
they're going to at least take a hard look. I, I can't say that they'll adopt it because I've been in NFO too long. When you make money, that's when you're in trouble. But right now, those people will then begin to have an alternative. Even if I, I don't, they don't take the contract, they're going to begin to say, hey, we've got another place to go. We don't have to take these garbage prices. Folks, this is national. New York is involved, Florida is involved, the Texas people are involved, Denver's involved, Salt Lake's involved, Walla Walla and Washington are down here in the, in the Imperial Valley in, in, in California. No matter where we are, we're all influencing that market. And the place that they can find is just like this with water, the place, the lowest place they're going to do, they'll drain it to the lowest place. That's just that simple. You guys at Irrigate? know exactly what I'm talking about. Leave a low spot in your field, you know exactly where to go look for the water. And that's exactly where a buyer looks for his, the low spot. That's just, that's just, there's nothing, there's nothing mystique, uh, mystery about this. That's just plain ordinary bargaining. Now the problem with us, and the banker pointed it out, and I've known it for a long time, is the fact that we're the only group of people that come in and deliver our game plan to the opposition prior to the start of the game. And what do I? That's exactly what we do. The buyer calls you up. You'll tell him not only how many lambs or calves you got, how many uh, doubles you had, uh, how, the, how the feed conditions are, when you're going to market them, what's the local market. You'll not only tell him all that, but you'll tell him about this neighbor and that neighbor and this neighbor and that. When he gets done with you, he has got probably at least a radius, depending in the west, is a 200 mile radius, and they probably here in the Midwest is 50 miles. He can tell what's going on in the whole area. Now that's the information your represents, representatives need. That's the ammunition we need, not the opposition. We do not need to tell them that we're going to go off left tackle in the third play. It's just not done, but we do it, and then wonder why we get stopped at line of scrimmage or not thrown for a loss if, if nothing else. Now you're going to get a lot of ideas at this convention. You're going to hear a lot of different things and you're going to, some of you will be stimulated by it. But I'm going to make one sure statement and I'm not too good on positive statements because everything changes. But I can almost guarantee you that if you take a real good idea and take it home and put no action to it, that you're going to come up with nothing. I just about figure that. And I can say one thing to the sheep men. That if the sheep men, if they had range, if their range bucks paid as much attention to their responsibilities as they do to marketing, they wouldn't have to worry about a lamb crop. <laughs> now, the day of rainy day marketing is over. This business of it raining, and you're looking out the breakfast window and saying, Ma, what are we going to do today? And you say, I think it'd be a good day to go to town and sell some stock. We haven't got anything else to do. That day's over with. We've got to get in the habit of when those sheep come to town and you're making delivery, all your calves come to town, and you make that delivery, and you're getting your check signed by NFO or your town or sale at that moment in time, we need to also have one more document, and we need to be signing up next year's crop. Now that does two things right immediately. It takes the slack out of the line. Number one, it allows the bargainer to immediately get to work. And number two, it allows you to do the best job possible that you're qualified for. You have the reputation of being the greatest producers in the whole world. Nobody tops your act. That's what you're good at. We can't make any money at it because we're not good marketers or bargainers. But we are good producers, and we've been taught and trained to be good producers. And I think exactly that ma top management, if you're looking at a total management position, it says that, look, put a cattleman as a cattleman, a sheepman as a sheepman, put farmers as farmers and do and let, let farmers do just like you do. You hire, a, a, you go ahead and get a combine to harvest. We're the same type of tools. Use us. This organization is a marketing and bargaining tool that can come collectively be used. And 
If you don't use it, then you're just you're just like the fella that's got a tractor in the in the, in the shed and would rather take the horse out and plow around. If that's what you want to do, you've got the choice. But I don't see how you can stay in business doing it. I'm going to say right now that the ball is definitely in your court. It's not only in your court for the volume. The sheep program's been in, 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 in good position for more than two or three years. I can remember not too long ago, say, the sheep program has arrived. We're in position. Why aren't we doing more? One thing, the volume. And when I say this, I mean there's another pretty good formula. I try to keep it simple. They say, you know, when you keep, you know, the old kiss situation, keep it simple, stupid. And this is just how simple it is. Your bargaining power will be exactly equal to the volume that it represents. Little volume, little bargaining power. Big volume, big bargaining power. Just that simple. We don't have to go through the, uh, get a doctorate in, man, in, in, in marketing and bargaining. It's just that simple. You get the volume together, you're going to have the bargaining power. And if you don't have the, bargain, the volume, you will not have the bargaining power. It is going to do, and there's nobody better qualified to get the volume in the United States together than the people that are in this room right now. Now, you can hire all the hotshot dudes like me or Hackney and get us out here and chase these cattle and sheep around for you. That's great. But there's nobody, absolutely nobody, that can talk to a farmer better than another farmer. Bar none. I don't care who you want to go out and hire. I don't care how pretty you or handsome he is or whatever, there's nobody going to reach a farmer better than another farmer. So there again, the ball is in your court. We've got the right people. There isn't anybody in this thing here left in NFO today that figures we're going to do, and I'm borrowing it from Gary, reach into the hat, so to speak, and pull out the rabbit. The get-rich overnight people are long gone. So we don't have to go through a lot of uh, of sifting and, and, and horsing around. But we've still got to go back to those people and we've still got to get this concept across because whether we like it or not, if we do not get it across and we're not able to get it across, then we are doomed to this business as usual, the same situation until God, where do we phase out, I don't know. But I, you know, the guy just makes a statement. You know, it's been said for a long time, I guess we'll survive. Is that, is that what we're sitting here to, to, to determine today? I guess we'll survive for another year? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think a lot of us want to have that kind of an atmosphere. We need to change that image. We need to change the image from being losers and we need to be, to be leaders. A farmer just doesn't necess necessarily have to accept the role that societies have placed on him and call him a dumb farmer. You're not a dumb farmer. You wouldn't be the greatest producers in the world if you were dumb farmers. But we're, we're human, and we can have our blind side. And I'm going to tell you one thing. One of them has been collective bargaining. We can't. There's nobody that would be out there in the farm that had a, a truck stuck in the mud that doesn't know that if he's trying to push it out alone, he's not going to get it. But if he's got a half a dozen of his neighbors, the, stuff, the thing rolls forward. Now, it's just that simple. And it's got to come from you people. It's not going to come from people like myself. Last year, let's talk about price. Last year, I sold the, the Imperial or the San Luis Valley lambs at 69 cents. And when I delivered them, they were worth 45. Now I expected to have to go down and rent out the fairground to accommodate the crowd that was going to sign up for that sheep program. I didn't need to. In fact, they were so busy doing other things because they got such a good price for their sheep, they didn't have to worry about the sheep, so they were worried about malt barley. That I just got through selling a load yesterday for 46 cents because we didn't get these lambs signed up so I could move with them. I called them. But there's one thing I can do about everything for you in marketing and bargaining except one thing. 
I can't sign that contract for sale for you. I can't do that. That takes you. I'm going to close with something I read last night just before I went to bed, and I thought it really was apropos for us. It's a statement by General MacArthur, and his statement is, there is absolutely no security. There is only opportunity. And gentlemen, we have the opportunity. It's here. And it's up to you guys to use it. Thank you.
bartering, marketing. That's our training. That's what you have hired us to do. The production is where you excel to the maximum. But yet you took on the role of a marketer, of a bartender, and said no to 85 and 87 cent kids and got 75. Last late winter or spring, early spring, maybe in its fact it was February, Gary and I got invited up to Montana to a midwinter convention. Gary went to have staff meetings to conduct ratification meetings with feeder cattle producers in Montana at that convention on the basis that he had in his pocket 83 to 85 cent money for him for last for this past fall's contracted kid. Again, you took on the posture of the bargain. You took on the position of not only being an excellent producer, but disillusioned in becoming a marketer. Well, that went a little further in Montana. Gary got turned down completely that afternoon in the ratification meeting. That night, I'd gone up to speak at their banquet meeting that night. And I had plenty to talk about because of what I had seen happen that afternoon. And I sat in that banquet and could hardly eat my dinner and when I got done eating, I couldn't wait to get to that night. And when I got to that night, I told them they were damn fools. I told them, I said, boys, all you have done is blow your brains out for another year. I said, if you don't take the 83 to 85 cent money that at that current time was not even offered or available by any buyer in the United States, in fact, there was not even another buyer anywhere willing to contract out. And we had, Gary had, that money in his hand. I said, if you don't take it this year, the corn belt producer is going to have an inadequate cash supply. He's going to have an extremely high interest rate. He's going to be losing 50 and 75 bucks a head on his cow. He is not going to be able to buy the 100 head he bought a year ago. His banker's only going to let him buy 50 this time. And you guys are going to take 52 to 62 cents a pound for your kids this fall. Well, I'll tell you how far I got with him. Before Gary and I got back to Corning, they had called the bond. They had told the bond, if you send that crippled SOB back to Montana to insult us again, we'll break his good back. <laughs> Three weeks ago, Gary sold Montana kills at 52 and a half and 62 cents that could have been on that block. You see, I hate like hell to be right under those conditions. It's shameful that I have to be right under those conditions. That's why I don't at times like the role as devil's advocate I must take at times. But someone has got to bring you back to reality. Gary is here. He's got a credibility thing that he must maintain with you as director of the feeder division. Dick is here, by the way. Dick is under the exact same situation as Gary. Two years ago, this 70 cent order he was talking about, he could have bought 100,000 head of land on that 68 and 70 cent order that were uncontractable and in fact sold for 45 cents fat. This spring was exactly the same damn thing. He had a 55 to 65 cent contract available. 
They were uncontractable, and he is moving lands from 42 to 45 cents a pound. So it's no difference between the two of these men. But I seem to have to be, in fact, it's my responsibility to really tell you where you are in regards to borders. I don't know how to say it without offending someone. I, I, the only way I can say it is to simply tell you there is no way I could produce as well as you do because you know so damn much more about producing than I know. So by saying that, then I feel like I can say you can't market near as well as Gary can or I can or Dick can because of what we know.